Did Albert Einstein have it all wrong? New findings on dark energy are challenging one of his theories and our understanding of the universe. We can't see it, we don't fully understand it, but we know it's out there and is hugely powerful. So-called dark energy is a mysterious force spread throughout space. It's believed to make up around 68% of the total energy content in the universe and causes the universe to expand at an ever faster rate. Dark energy seems to be something that's tied to the structure of space itself. Albert Einstein, in his theory of general relativity, theorized it is a cosmological constant, an intrinsic part of space itself. But a newly released study suggests that's not the case. It's definitely absolutely got the, the full attention of the, of the cosmology community worldwide and it's potentially telling us something fundamental about the way that the universe evolves and also about fundamental physics. Using a special dark energy spectroscopic instrument in Arizona, scientists, including several Australians, looked at data from around 15 million galaxies and quasars over three years and examined how gravity is warping light. The data suggests dark energy has not remained constant. In fact, it has weakened. And that's led cosmologists to consider whether the expansion will continue to accelerate, slow, stop, or even reverse. If dark energy is evolving with time, it means that our standard model for cosmology uh, is incomplete and also can have a strong impact on the ultimate fate of our universe. The findings were presented at a summit in California this week. While more data is needed to confirm, this may eventually be considered a universe-shaking study. A camera the size of a car is about to change everything that we know about our cosmos. It will peer into the deep unknown space with unprecedented precision. Our next story explains how the secrets of dark energy, dark matter and the structure of our universe are all about to be revealed. Take a look. So for you, why, why is it important to study these things out there in space? Uh -huh. Well, first of all, as I said, I like stories. I think the story of the universe is the biggest and most exciting one we have. And, you know, just answering basic questions about the universe is, to me, very exciting. And I just feel very honored to be able to, you know, tell a part of that story. On a more, you know, interesting level, like why do we care about black holes in the first place, you can imagine, you know, black holes have environments that are so extreme we can't test in laboratories on Earth. You basically have to go to outer space in order to study these extremes, like, you know, a black hole that's millions and millions of times the mass of our sun. Suddenly, years after something has happened that's a very violent explosion, you're having these weird outflows happening. That's a completely new parameter space in physics that we don't understand. We don't know what's causing these. So being able to probe these and maybe get understand what's happening could tell us new physics about what's out there. This is the universe as seen through the lens of the Euclid telescope. 26 million galaxies captured so far, 35 terabytes of images, which have been put together to form a map of the cosmos. And this is just the beginning. It's only one week's work of mapping the sky. The mission, carried out by the European Space Agency, is due to last six years, over which researchers hope to map one third of the extragalactic sky with such detail. Some of these galaxies are over 10 billion light years away from us, and by scanning them multiple times, the telescope will capture them at different stages of their evolution. And this, scientists hope, will help understand how structures have formed and changed over billions of years. It's impossible to, to visualize all the galaxies. There will be billions of galaxies. So in many areas of astronomy, AI will be used more and more to, to, to classify and, and find, also to find a new uh, object. Euclid is just starting this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this survey. It will keep us busy for, for many more years. And uh, we, are, we are all very excited and the scientific community by, by the great potential. Euclid's nickname is the Dark Universe Detective. Its ultimate purpose is to shed some light on dark matter, which is believed to be what holds galaxies together, as well as on dark energy. Dark energy pulls galaxies apart by making the universe expand faster and faster over time. So I just want to start, um, can you describe how you kind of got interested in astronomy and in black hole research? 
Sure. So I decided I wanted to be an astronomer when I was 13 years old, and I read a book about astronomy, actually. It was just, I had a very long school bus ride home, would always read a library book going home, and there was one that was about astronomy, and by the time I finished it, it was just, that's what I always wanted to do since, uh, basically because I've always loved stories, and the story of our universe is the biggest one that we have. Um, I decided to become a radio astronomer specifically after seeing a the movie Contact and reading the book by Carl Sagan, actually. So I wanted to be Ellie Arroway uh, mm -hmm. in that when I grew up. Excellent. So what are these uh, things called black holes? What are they and what are they not? Uh, so a black hole is a compact object in space. What we mean by that is that it's an area so dense with uh, material that light, which is the fastest thing in the universe, cannot escape it. So if you were on Earth and you shot up a rocket fast enough, you'd be able to escape the Earth. You could never shoot anything fast enough in our universe to escape a black hole. That's what a black hole is. There's a lot of misconceptions about black holes. One of them is they don't actually suck in things. People think black holes are giant vacuum cleaners with pull in everything around them, uh, passively or not. That's not how they work. You basically, it's it, because it has a, a mass very concentrated in area, like it will have things that fall in at a greater frequency. But the way, better way to think of a black hole is if our sun, for example, shrunk into the size of a black hole, it would immediately be, you know, just two kilometers across, a very tiny compact object. But our orbit on Earth and all the other planets and everything would not actually change. We would keep going around the black hole. So it's not that they're magic vacuum cleaners in space. Are there different types of flavors of black holes and, you know, different kinds? Uh, there are different kinds of black hole. So there's two major categories of black hole. The first are stellar mass black holes. What we mean by that is when a supermassive star dies, when I say supermassive, maybe 18 times more massive than our own sun uh, dies at the end of its life, it will leave behind a black hole uh, as its remnant afterward. Uh, the other kind of black hole that we have, though, is a very different beast. They're called supermassive black holes. Supermassive black holes are a million to even a, over a billion times the mass of our sun, and they tend to live at the center of our uh, center of galaxies. Every single galaxy, pretty much, uh, that's a larger normal galaxy like our Milky Way, including our own Milky Way, has a supermassive black hole at the center. All right. So, I want to talk about the new way. Astronomers are finding black holes using Gaia data, but mm -hmm. before we get into that, um, how do astronomers find and confirm mm -hmm. black holes? So there's several different ways uh, you can find black holes. So black holes are also not completely black. We don't see anything leaving from the black hole, but as the material gets closer to the black hole, it will emit light uh, in different wavelengths, and that's what we can uh, look at to see a black hole. So, for example, in radio emission, where I study things, if there's gas or a star falling onto a supermassive black hole, as it's going and interacting with the environment around the black hole, you'll see radio uh, flares and radio uh, wavelengths escaping from the environment of the black hole. That's usually a very good clue that there's one there. Okay. And so, turn to the new way astronomers are finding black holes. They're using Gaia data. Mm -hmm. uh, but first, before we talk about that, what is Gaia and what does it do? So Gaia is a European Space Agency probe that went up roughly a decade ago. I can't remember exactly which year. Um, that basically the idea is that it's going to, it looked at all the stars, like almost a billion stars in the sky. You wait a few months, so six months, you know, we're at the opposite side of the sun in our orbit. You look again, you will get a very precise uh, positional change in all the objects in the sky and how much they've shifted over time. They did this for several years. They recently stopped a few months ago. They uh, stopped collecting data. The uh, mission ended, but they still have so much data that it's going to be years and years before we go through all of it. So it's a very exciting way to basically just know where everything is in the universe, exact positions of things, how fast they're moving across the sky, things like that. And so how are astronomers using that data to find black holes? So you could imagine if you had very, very precise uh, information on a star, it's precise enough that if a star was wobbling in its orbit because of a companion like a black hole, back and forth, back and forth, you would see the slight shift in the, it's called the astrometry, the precise position of the star. And then you could basically then follow up with a better telescope to confirm that the motion of the star is due to a companion so massive that it has to be a black hole. And what, how far away are these black holes? 
So for the Gaia black holes, mm -hmm. uh, they're actually the closest black holes that we know of to Earth. So the closest black hole, about 1,600 light years from us. So that means it takes the light from this system 1,600 years to reach us, uh, which is, of course, the fastest thing in our universe. And does it make a difference? Does it make it easier or harder to find these black holes with Gaia based on their distance from us? Yes. Well, things that are closer, uh, the positional accuracy, uh, you notice a greater shift as things are closer. So these are all, you know, it sounds very far away. It is very far away. But this is really still very much in our galactic neighborhood. The Milky Way for scale is about 100,000 light years from one end to the other. So this is still basically next door. Is there anything different about these black holes than the other ones that you've described? Yes, so there's actually several things. Uh, the, one of the things that is, so they're in binary pairs. So there's a normal stellar companion. So the first black hole discovered called Gaia Black Hole 1 or Gaia BH1 for short. Uh, it basically has a stellar companion about the mass of our sun. So a very sun-like star that they noticed it was wobbling. And basically, it comes out to the equivalent of the distance at Mars. There's something that's about eight times the mass of our sun. So you can imagine if you see the star very well in optical light and with Gaia data, you should be able to see a star if it was eight times more massive much, much more easily. But we don't see the star. So people realize that, that astronomers realize that must be a black hole.